Psalm 12, in verse number 6, is where we're going to start from tonight. Hopefully you brought your Bible. We're going to be several places tonight as we talk about the Bible specifically. And really the, the thought is, for the next um, little while, maybe two or three weeks or so, uh, of course, not uh, this week, but next week we've got uh, the, the group coming from West Coast Baptist College. And so next week is our service that we're moving from Wednesday to Thursday. So don't come on Wednesday next week. We're going to come on Thursday because they're going to come and, and minister to us in song. And uh, we'll have, of course, a preaching that night, that night also. Um, but uh, we'll start this tonight and then probably in another uh, couple of weeks we'll uh, pick back up with uh, where we're going to leave off tonight. But the, the question is in this uh, sermon, uh, this lesson tonight, as we are finishing off uh, this uh, study, this survey of the Bible in general, so to speak, and we've just called the series Rightly Dividing, how do we understand our Bible? How can we know uh, what the Bible is saying to us. As we turn into, say, a book like Ezekiel, do we know the setting of that book? Uh, do we understand what God is trying to uh, say in that book? What's the theme of that book? Because it does help us when we turn to those passages to understand what's being said. And so we don't just take a passage out of Scripture and put it on our Facebook page and say, oh, see here, here's a promise for me, when that was never meant to be a promise for you, maybe. Maybe that was a promise for God's people in Israel. Maybe that was a specific promise for a specific person. And it wasn't even addressed to us, but we need to be properly understanding of our Bible. And so that's what we've been doing, kind of taking, as we've stated, a view from 30,000 feet, so to speak, not really digging in depth in any one book or any one passage, just giving ourselves an overview of this grand narrative of the Bible. So if we just do a couple of questions of review, I'm looking to just be disappointed fully tonight and, and uh, know that you probably won't uh, come up with any answers because you never talk back or you never, you just sit there like, <laughs> who's the Bible about? Who's the Bible about? Jesus, right? From Genesis to Revelation, the entirety of the book is about Jesus Christ. Now, does it say his name every place? No. No, sometimes God uses types or symbols or pictures. Other times in other places he alludes to certain events that will take place. There are different prophecies that take place in our Bible. But the entirety is, is building toward the coming of his son, the, the birth of his son, the life of his son, the death of his son, and then the glorious resurrection of his son. And how does that play out in these different groups of people? And what is the truth that God is trying to get across to us? And it's just, he does it in a myriad different ways, but it's just amazing how it all fits perfectly together. Now, all that being said, our thought for tonight is, okay, so what about all these Bible versions? That there's so many of them out there. And when I go to the Bible bookstore and I'm looking at Bibles... Why is there a whole wall and which one do I pick? Why, why do we stay with or why do we select? Why are we staying with this Bible that we are using tonight, specifically the King James Bible? Why are we in or why, are we, why do we use this book specifically? We're going to look at it, hopefully from a practical perspective. Hopefully it will be a help to you over the next uh, few weeks here. Psalm 12, if you find verse number 6, if you'll stand with me, if you're physically able, and we'll read just two verses here uh, to jump off from tonight. Psalm 12, look at verse number 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Now, the word them has, here's a good word, an antecedent. <laughs> what is that? I don't even know how to spell that. Yeah. What does the them refer to in verse number 7? What is them referring to? Thou shalt keep them. The words, yes. So the words is what God is going to be keeping. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve, there, is a, there it is again, them, the words. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation. And notice, forever. Right? Forever. Let's pray. Lord, again, grateful for the opportunity to pray. Thank you for your word and what it teaches us about itself. Help us, please, to be clear in what we're saying tonight, and we'll be very grateful for your help. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Now, Psalm 12, verse number 7. How we define the word preserve in Psalm 12, 7 
is going to determine your line of thinking about which Bible version you are uh, going to be accepting of or which Bible version you are going to select or use in your personal life, in your personal devotional time. And according to the truth in these, these verses, this book, the, the Bible that you hold in your lap, this book is not like any other book. All right. This book is not like any other ancient text. It's not like, uh, uh, it's certainly not like the Koran. It's not like uh, uh, the, the uh, words of uh, the, the Buddhist or they're not like the words of the Hindu. This is a unique and a, we would say this is a, a supernatural book. All right. Now, look with me, if you would, to the New Testament in 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Now what we're going to do tonight in the next uh, few weeks is uh, for a, maybe an unbelieving uh, scholar or, or someone who is uh, kind of the more critical mindset, and by that I mean kind of more of an examining mindset, we're going to break a couple of rules here, and by that what we're going to do is use this book itself to defend this book, all right? Now, for you know, some of you who are smarter than it's good for you, you know that's, that's not a great rule to have, but the issue is every other book is written by man. This book is written by God. And so because of its supernatural origin, it has the ability, the opportunity, to stand on its own merit. And we can look at this book to defend what this book is all about, what this book says about itself. Okay, so 2 Timothy chapter number 3, look at verse number 14. Paul is writing to this pastor named Timothy, and notice what he says, but what's the word? Continue. All right? Continue thou, what? In the things which thou hast learned, and notice this next phrase, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. All right? So, Paul is writing to, to Timothy and he's saying, you continue in those things that you've learned and not just the things that you've learned, but the things that you are resting in, that you've come to know this is the truth of the matter. I don't turn to any other person or any other thing but this book for my spiritual well-being. And Timothy, continue in those things. All right? So the question, we're going to raise a lot of questions, and, and oftentimes the, the question that people ask in, in talking about the Bible, in the scriptures, inspiration, those kind of things, the question that people oftentimes ask is, the wrong question, I, I guess we'll start there, the wrong question is, is it true? And I think that's the wrong place to start. The, the right place to start is, is this book supernatural? Right? Is this book different than any other book on the face of the earth? Right? If it is, then we, we can't put the same uh, kind of evaluation on this book as we would with a book from another fallen human being just like you or like me. Right? This book is, is so much more different than that. So the, the very first question is not, is it true? The very first question of the Bible should be, is it supernatural? And so set aside all the other things about this book, all the other blessings that this book brings. You understand, we're, we're just thinking, using our minds for a little bit. I know that's tough on a Wednesday night. You understand that this book is 100% true in the prophecies that are given in the pages therein. There's not one that has not come true, just as God said. Now, are there some that have not come to pass yet? Certainly. In fact, we looked at some of those in the book of Revelation the last two or three weeks. All right? There are some things that God has told us will take place that haven't yet, but the things that He has said will take place, and even in the manner and the people that He, he names. We looked at, you remember at Cyrus? in the book of Isaiah, before Cyrus even comes on the scene, and that Cyrus is going to be used by God to bring God's people back into the land of Jerusalem. And guess what happens? Years later, hundreds of years later, it actually takes place. That's amazing. And so this book is 100% true in, in every prophecy that God has given. Okay, so let's just talk, uh, let's make it simple to get how amazing that is. If I was, if I, if I stood up here tonight and I told you 
10 prophecies about your life. And one of those 10 prophecies came true. What, what's that percentage? 10%, good, we're, we're good, we're flying so far. 10%, if I was 10% true in the things that I said, do you understand how amazing that would be? If you knew that I was 10% right in the things that I said, and I said, uh, Tyler, tonight, I don't want you to go take uh, 130 home, I want you to take the back road home, because if you get on 130, you're going to get in a wreck. If I was 10% true, would you take 130? I wouldn't chance it. What if that's the one that I got right? You understand if I was 10% true, that would be amazing. That in itself would be supernatural. The Bible has never failed in one prophecy. Not one. Not one thing that God has said would take place has, has failed in its fulfillment. That is an amazing, amazing truth. There are truckloads of things that... that took place exactly like God said. In spite of all the efforts to try to eliminate this book and to disregard this book and to ignore this book, this book still stands. Amen. This book is still, still present in, in hundreds of languages, in multitudes of countries, in, in villages, in towns, in, in metropolitan places. This book stands. Another evidence, this book is supernatural. This book is counterintuitive, so to speak. It goes against uh, things in our culture. That is, it doesn't do things. The way that God does things is not the way that we might do things. That's true not just in our day and time. You understand that's been true in every era, in every age, in every time period. From the very first, this book is against the way that man would do things. That tells me man didn't write this book. Right? Um, look at every uh, man-made religion or man-made way of doing things. We'll, we'll just focus on religion. How does man imagine himself getting into heaven or nirvana or, or whatever place they want to call it? How does man get there? It's some, uh, some way it's based on something that he's done. It's merit-based. Every single one of them. You have to do these things once you get past this point. And for most of them, you never know where the point is. Do I know for sure? You understand in this book, it, it, it's, it, it's nowhere near that. It is grace-based. It, it's not what you have done. What you've done is get yourself in trouble. You're a sinner. But it is what Jesus Christ has done. See, man doesn't come up with that kind of a plan. This book is, is supernatural in its origin. It is an infinite book. It, it crosses cultures. It, it, it crosses uh, time and, and outside of time and spaces where God lives. So that makes sense that he's able to speak to every generation from the beginning to 2018, January 3rd. Right? Why? Because he doesn't have time. He's able to see it all. You understand, God, when God looks down, He doesn't work like with a watch. Okay? <laughs> he doesn't have a watch. He sees the, the all of human history, all is one timeline, if you want to use that phrase. He, he sees every bit of it. There's nothing that He doesn't see or doesn't know. Right? Now that alone ought to just, psh, my mind is blown. Right? But he works outside of that. And so he is able to give us a book. And by the way, he's able to preserve a book that crosses all of that. That transcends time and, and, and history and all of those things. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, look at verse number 15. And that from a child thou hast known, notice, the holy scriptures. Okay, I got a question. Um, did, did Paul believe that the, the Bible, the, the passages of the Bible, even the letters that, that, some of the letters that he wrote, did he believe that those were inspired by God? Yes. He calls them holy scriptures. Right? Are we talking about in 2 Timothy 3 and verse number 15, is he meaning that Timothy had access to the actual originals that were written? For example... Did, he, did Timothy have access to Moses' handwritten 
transcript of what God inspired him to write? No. No. What are we talking about in 2 Timothy 3.15? Are we talking about it was copied down? Yes. Yes. Yes, multitude of time. In fact, those holy scriptures that God's people understood to be from God, originating from Him, inspired by Him, were meticulously copied down and passed from generation to generation to generation. Right? Timothy didn't have access to the original manuscripts. By the way, neither did Paul. But yet still a, a copy of the scripture has the same power, is the same thing as the original that was written and inspired by God. Right? If I, um, all right, here's an easy one. This is like an easy softball question. If I preserve peaches and I put them in a jar and I put them on the shelf, what's in the jar? Come on, it's not hard. Peaches, right? I, it doesn't turn into oranges, right? I don't preserve apples and then, man, I can't wait to taste those pickles. <laughs> right? It doesn't work that way. You preserve what you have preserved. If God said he preserves his word and keeps it, what do we have? We're going to have his word, right? Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 3, look at verse number, well, we'll finish verse 15. That from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, notice, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, question, how much of Scripture? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Is this Bible valuable? You better believe that it is. Right? Believe that it is. Um, take your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. 2 Corinthians 2, look at verse 7. Sorry, 17. 2 Corinthians 2, 17. I missed the one. 2 Corinthians 2, 17. Have there been people, since the scriptures have been inspired, have there been people that have tried to corrupt what God said? Change what God said? Oh, you better believe it. Do you think that also took place even in first century Christianity? Well, let's look at this verse, 2 Corinthians 2, verse number 17. For we are not as many, notice, which corrupt the word of God. So we're talking about, we haven't even got to the first century A.D. And people are already trying to change the message of the gospel. Change what God has said in his word. There are people trying to, to, to corrupt what the Bible message is. And by the way, it wasn't just from enemies without, so to speak, without the church or, or outside of Christianity. These could even be people that were inside of these churches. Right? Crept in unawares is a, a phrase that is used by Peter, by Paul. Right? Uh, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing who try to come in and say, well, that's great you guys say, but you need to add this onto it. And they try to change and pervert what God has said. Right? Now, let's get closer to where we are trying to be here today. There's no Bible-believing group. All right? I'm talking Bible-believing. Orthodox Christians, let's say, that, that follow what this, this book says. There is no Bible-believing group or denomination or camp that does not draw lines as to what Bible versions they deem to be uh, trustworthy or reliable. Right? Every group, every denomination has their list. Here's, here's what we consider to be uh, trustworthy uh, or, or good versions of the Bible for, for our folks to use. These things are reliable. And in all of those groups, there are some versions that they would reject also. Because they know that there are some who, from without or from within, that try to corrupt or change God's Word. All right? So everyone agrees, every group. You, you won't find one that doesn't say, well, there's, we accept these, we don't accept these. 
All right, everyone has that, that list. So everyone agrees there are some corrupt versions out there and that not every version that you might be able to purchase or get your hands on, not every version says the same thing. Right? And, and I'm telling you, every group, every denomi de denomination, every camp has these, these versions that they would accept or rely upon. So I say that to, to, to help you, to encourage you. Don't feel bad when somebody gets frustrated with you or, or tries to demean you for picking a version. Right? Everybody has their lines. Now their line might be drawn differently than what you and I might draw. But everyone has their lines if they believe in what God said in His Word, if they love the Word of God. Everyone has their lines, right? They, they're just, that it's, it, they, it has to be that way. Now, the authorized version, what, what we would also call the King James Version of the Bible, the authorized version is the only one that is accepted in every one of those circles. It's the only one. Right? Every group, every denomination, every camp, they're at least going to accept that you could use the King James Version as a reliable version of the Bible. Okay, so question. And I'm trying to get you to think with me through this. Right? Can, can good, saved people see this Bible issue differently? You better believe so. Yes. Yes, uh, there are good men that I know, that I would be friends with, that would not stand solely on the King James Bible, right? Are they still, can they still be saved? Yes. No, there's no question about it, all right? Um, I don't uh, break off with someone just because they might in study use another version. Now, do I know what I believe? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do I see any reason to go away from this? No. No, I'm not looking to do that. Right? I've found what I believe to be, what I know to be God's Word for the English language, and, and that's what I'm going to stick with. But, but good people can, can differ on this. This is not something that we... Um, see, we don't stand at the door and with a trash can and slap other versions of Bibles out of people's hands when they come in. We don't do that. Right? We're not going to be contentious about that. Right? Because this Bible version issue is a learning issue. Right? It's a teaching thing. You, you have to help people understand why do you come to that position. Because I think for, for a long time in good churches like ours, we've just said, well, this is what we do because the pastor says that. Well, what about when somebody begins to question you about it? Well, I want you to talk to my pastor. Well, wh why can't any of us have a good, knowledgeable conversation about this. By the way, we should be able to articulate why we believe what we believe. We should be able to say, this is why I believe these things. So that's why we're here tonight on January 3rd, 2018. To, to give us some, some knowledge about this, some understanding about this. All right? Okay, so here's another question. Are there um, extreme, marginal... Um, Crazy types in the King James only camp? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Are there contentious people in either side? Yes. Yes. Is it, uh, do we need to be contentious about it? No. No. Do we need to stand strong on what we believe? Yes. Yes. But I'm not going to demean somebody or excommunicate them because they might think differently on this. All right? Um, if you've tried to read a good Christian book in really any time in your life, if you've tried to read a good Christian book, more than likely they're going to use more than one Bible version in that book. All right? Now, we believe that man's words are not inspired, but God's words are. Right? And so there are, there are different places that we're going to come across people that use a different version, a different uh, 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 Bible than we are. And again, we need to know what we believe on this, what we understand to be the truth about this. And what, is, what does God say about His Word? Again, that's why we're here tonight. And there, there are many groups in, in all of these that we're talking about. There are many groups that would esteem the King James Bible as the most reliable Bible. Right? 
Um, there are some that, that do not, and they have their, their choices about that. But many of these groups that we're talking about would esteem that the King James is the most reliable. We're going to talk some about that here in the, either tonight or the next coming weeks here. Now, let's get to your outline. I want you to, to have some important words in this debate, all right, or in this, this, uh, this, um, this subject. So here's the first important word. That is the word authority. Do we believe in an authoritative Bible that, like 2 Timothy 3.14, that we can be assured of? Do we believe that there is an authoritative Bible that we can be assured of? And do we need to, I, I just, I'm asking you to think, do we need to bring that to, to one version, or is it right when people include other versions? All right. Um, by the way, this is just a caveat onto that thought. Do you know that the Bibles that line up the most closely with your King James Bible, the ones that are, that are real close, they even say different things than this King James Bible does? Do you know they take words out? You know they add some too? They, they take entire passages out? They, they change doctrinal words? I'm talking the ones that are as almost, man, they're, they're close. Do we need to just go to one, or can we include these other versions? See? And again, I, I don't want to mislead you. I'm here with my King James Bible tonight, all right? We're, we're not talking about including other versions in our church. I want you to think with me about some of these things, all right? Um, because what's the sales pitch for most new versions? Well, they're basically the same. It's just the language has been updated. Right? It just, it, it's easier to understand uh, some of these, these different words. You know, that old King James is archaic and the these and the thous. By the way, did you know there's a reason for the these and the thous? Yeah, we're going to talk about that too. Right? There's a reason why they're in here. Don't, don't believe that, that it's, it's more readable or an updated language. It can be true in some places, but it's not comprehensively true about the Bible. And are we comfortable with even a few changes. Uh, can we let that slide? If we took the number of verses in the King James Bible, and we took, we, we said, okay, um, what's the percentage of change in this Bible versus the King James Bible? And, and we took the number of verses, and we took the number of changes. Even if it was 10% of, of a change, do you know that's 3,110 verses that are changed? Just 10%. And many of them on the shelves are different in much more than 10%. And if they don't all say the same thing, now here's what I'm trying to get us to, to come to. If they don't all say the same thing, or they don't all contain the same thing, who is to say which one is the Word of God? Because if I go to Matthew 4 and verse number 4, Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So do I need every word? According to what Jesus said, that's what I'm supposed to have. And I go to different versions and there's 64,000 words cut out? I'm already not looking great when it comes to Matthew 4.4. 4. Right? So you see, we, we've got trouble if, we don't, if we're, not, uh, we're not thinking through this issue. Now, I want you to turn to a verse, Revelation chapter number 8 and verse number 13. Revelation 8 and verse number 13. And I just want to show you one example. In the coming weeks, I'll probably give you a few more examples like this, but I just want to show you one that we're talking about, all right? Revelation 8, verse number 13. And I beheld and heard and what? An angel. I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Question. In Revelation 8.13, who is doing the speaking of the woes? Who's saying that? An angel. 
right? Is that, we should be able to get that, right? We can understand an angel is supposed to be speaking, Revelation 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse number 13. Now, I'm going to put a verse up here from a prominent modern version, the, the New International Version, the NIV. And I want to see if you catch the difference. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in the midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. So I have a question. Did God mean angel or did he mean eagle? Because those two things are not the same things. And last time I checked, I have never seen an eagle speak like that. But I've read regularly in the Bible where angels are speaking. Did God write it both ways? No. You understand, that's, just, that's one. That's one. And we've got a, a big problem in, in who's doing the speaking and what is being portrayed in our Bible. Because can I help you? If we don't have a final authority for our life, we don't have anything. If I don't have something that I can turn to and definitively say, this is what God said. This is what God said about my salvation. This is what God says about my sinfulness, about my eternal destiny. Then what honestly do I have? I'm just going on my own opinion, my own volition. Right? Now, don't draw the line. I'm not drawing. I am not saying if somebody has an NIV, they can't be saved. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we need to understand this book. We ought to hold this book in such a high regard that we understand this book is the final authority for our lives. And it's important what it says. And we wonder why our young people uh, go to, at the very least, go to another version or, or begin attending other churches or get out of church altogether. It's because we've never taught them, why do you believe what you believe? Do you understand what the Bible says about itself? When, when they get on a college campus or even in a high school campus and they begin to be questioned on some of these things, what do they say? Well, that's just what our church believes. Well, no offense, but that doesn't hold any water. Because this church is made up of, guess what? A bunch of sinful human beings just like everybody else out there. We have to have a final authority. Thus saith the Lord. Because if we don't, we, don't, we have nothing. All right? Let me give you the second word and we'll finish here. All right? Second word. First one was authority. The second one is supernatural versus natural. Supernatural versus natural. Here's the question. We'll finish. Do we approach the Bible like any other book or text or... Do we believe in God's divine and powerful providence to keep this book preserved for us today? Right? Is it supernatural or is it just, well, there's a lot of human writers of the book. You know, it's just written by other humans, is it? That's not what it says about itself. Either you don't know your Bible or the Bible's a liar. That's the only two options. All right? Because the Bible says um, this book is of no private interpretation. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That word inspiration literally means God breathed it out. I mean, this is a, it's an amazing book. So don't just say, well, I mean, really, what's the difference? It's just a, a different version, is it? Did God say angel or did he say eagle? Again, that's just one. In coming weeks, we're going to take you to passages like Matthew 18, 11. In fact, turn there. Look at Matthew 18, 11. Pastor, you said we were going to be done. I know, I know, I know. Pastor 18, or, sorry, Matthew 18, 11, not Pastor 18, 11. If you find Pastor 18, 11, tear it out. Throw that Bible away. That's not the right one. All right. Matthew 18, verse number 11.
So read the verse. Is that an important verse? Yes. That's the mission statement of our Lord and Savior. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. If, and I've got one, I debated bringing it in, I'll bring it in in later weeks. I've got an NIV in my office that I keep just to, for things like this. Do you know that in the NIV it goes from Matthew 18.10 to Matthew 18.12? Sorry, Matthew 18.14. Verse 13 is cut out. There is none. So evidently, they don't think you can count or you're not keeping track. But there's no... Matthew 18, sorry, what did I say? Matthew 18, 11. It goes from verse 10 to verse 12. It's just gone. And that's not the only instance that it happens. In a version like the NIV. And we're not just paying on that one. They come from, and here's where we're going to get to, they come from, there's two distinct lines where these Bibles come from. All right? And all of the, well, most of the modern versions come from this faulty line. And it cuts out things like the last uh, 12 verses of the, the last chapter of the book of Mark, which is the resurrection account and the great commission of Christ to preach the gospel to every creature. At the very least, there would be a footnote in your Bible. In fact, this is a King James Schofield reference Bible. You know what it's, I looked it up today. In the last chapter of the book of Mark, it says, in the oldest manuscripts, these verses are not present. What is that doing? It casts a little bit of doubt. Well, maybe I don't need those verses. You understand? You've got to pay attention. God's words are inspired. Man's words are not. All right? So we'll get to those instances in different places. But the idea is not to fight about it, not to be contentious with others. The idea is, let's know why we do what we do. Don't just say, well, this is who we are. Let's know why this is why we are and, and what we believe and why we believe it.